Hey, this is Car Reporter here with an exclusive Horror 101 interview. Today we're talking to Navek Ogre about his band's new release, The Devil's in My Details, and his work on the new movie, Repo the Genetic Opera. Your experience on Repo was uh, pretty good. Um, and I, I was reading that you really loved your time in the makeup chair, especially. Yeah. Was it any different experience for you doing that than it was being in the makeup chair for like the last right tour that you did? Oh yeah, extreme. I mean, there was a, a room that was consistent. There was a, a hotel that I was driven from and to, not for you know personal diva reasons, but for liability reasons, and that you're involved in a movie where they have you know a, a great deal of money involved in something, so that they'll take you from point A to point B and back again. And, uh, you know, on Last Rites, we're doing a lot of shows where you don't have control over the environment you're in, you don't have showers, you don't have uh, the facilities that you do, uh, right. per se. I, you know, I had a trailer with Repo, so I could go back to that and uh, find comfort there. It was very comfortable and uh, a whole different gig in, in that respect, you know. Um, it made waking up at five in the morning just a joy. I mean, for me, it was a joy because, again, like as a child, I always wanted to be that guy in Jack Pierce's chair or, you know, Rick Baker or any number of, you know, makeup can be, you know, any number of people um, right. uh, that, that have, uh, have, uh, have done that. It's been a dream of mine to, to be under prosthetics, and I've never had a chance to actually go under, you know, complete prosthetics, let alone silicone, like state-of-the-art silicone prosthetics, and some of the newer stuff which they're using to do all the scarring, which is, uh, it's, it's the glue that they actually use to attach the silicone masks. Mm -hmm. They found that uh, you're not supposed to freeze it, but somebody left one, in, or left some in, in a freezer, and it became this realized they could mold um, almost like tattoos, reverse tattoos on them. And so the scarring was all based on this glue, which is a bit of a pain in the ass to take off at the end of the day. <laughs> right. Unless you sweat a lot. Like there was one day I was on set for five minutes um, after being, you know, going through a three hour process. And then because you don't sweat, um, you're, you're stuck. And, and it, the, the removal that night was hell. The one night was, was hell. But every other night, because I was moving around enough, the, the oils in your face, made it a lot easier to break down so it, was, it wasn't it wasn't a big deal to get out of. but I was definitely like you know on my days I was the first one in usually and the last one last one to leave but again I was working with a guy you know Sean and Damon who were like who worked on everything from you know all the Romero movies to just a shitload of movies and uh, they were awesome because they're very politically active up in Canada so we had lots to talk about so it was kind of a beyond my expectations of doing all that kind of stuff uh, you know a lot of fun and of course transforming into a uh, narcissistic serial killer rapist was was uh, was a blast, you know. <laughs> I'm <obviously>. sure. <laughs> yeah, you're the comic relief with uh, yeah, Bill Mosley in it, of course. right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Which is kind of strange to have, you know, characters like that be the comic relief, but I think it'd be a good change, you know, something different. Well, I think it was necessary in that film <clears throat> not to, again, if it just went completely dark all the way, it wouldn't have worked as a film. I think the idea was in, was was to really embrace the uh, you know the black comedy obviously and, and the satirical side of what the film was about and I think that beyond that it stretches out into you know kind of a socio political way of looking at things especially in these days and days where, where everything is being repossessed and you know, a lot of stuff is kind of made to that point where yeah. it's a pay to play nation in a lot of ways and, and uh, you know it was, it was good timing for that too in a lot of ways and, and I think that uh, you know ultimately I, I think. Uh, for me, as, as, as a character, it was an amazing step to take because Ogre is a much more serious character, a much more kind of, you know, the, you know, the, the darker side of my personality or the side that deals with the things that scares Kevin Ogilvy. And so to be able to go into a falsetto voice and do something that was, you know, a maniacal character, but with this, this you know, narcissistic kind of, you know, feminine kind of hands-off, but, you know, hands-on kind of thing, it was, you know, it was a great, great thing for me to kind of, like, step into and do. And when I did my um, my monologue for it, it was all comedy. It was all kind of really reaching for that part of the character because I saw that that's kind of what was important. And, and then I kind of went to Conrad Bite, you know, one of my big inspirations as a kid too, with a man who laughs, uh, with the leering smile kind of behind the mask. Oh, when the mask was off, much more kind of mole-like, intimidated, you know, evil mm -hmm. kind of thing was there. But when the mask came on, it was all, you know, here's Poppy with his new face, and so. I used I used Conrad Byte, you know, again, I'm nowhere near what Conrad Byte does, but just that, that idea of the man who laughs, I kind of tried to incorporate that into the character. That was a great movie. Um, 
Now, you, you, you work with Bill Mosley pretty closely in the movie, and then um, you, you have him on the new album, Devils in My Details. Um, I was reading that you, 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 pretty, you bonded pretty well with him on the making of the film, found a lot of common ground. Was it kind of like a, you know, a, a, a dream come true almost to um, n not just sample him from the films that he did before, like Texas Chainsaw? and uh with his character chop top but to actually have him come in and, and do something to for the album yeah i mean it was a layer it was it was a layer to the album that we hadn't expected basically like we were going through doing this conceptual piece without thinking of using any sort of sample voices or samples you know you know this ethereal kind of narration and uh when i met bill up in toronto and we kind of uh, you know we met a month before and sang and we kind of bonded then and we had a curtain between us um, during all of the recording sessions and he was like take down that curtain I need to see my brother and that made me feel <laughs> really good because I was kind of uh, it was all very new to me obviously being on being in an ensemble cast and like not knowing about personalities and in this case I think I was lucky because everyone was very supportive of each other you know Paul Sorvino was, was very kind to me on set and uh, gave me a lot of support during one scene you know where he was too sick to actually come on but he actually came on for my close I was the last close up my, mine were the last close-ups and he was, you know, they asked me and said, you know, is it all right if Paul sits this out because he's not feeling very well, of course, you know, but then I heard this cane and he came <laughs> on and he goes, no, 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 I'm going to do it for him, you know, I, I want to be here and it was just like, you know, I was just like, whoa, so it, it, it made it really special for me and then, uh, you know, Bill, we bonded when we started recording and, uh, and, and talked and then uh, when we met in Toronto, we went out a number of times to get to know each other for the characters because we're brothers and siblings and, uh, and he um, was very gracious in giving me a lot of tips and uh, was always kind of there, you know, to tell me when, when we should head back to the trailer and get off set. And, you know, <laughs> really, really kind of took me under his wing in a lot of ways. And, uh, and uh, he, my, my girlfriend came up and visited um, one weekend or for a week. And uh, he had met her and, and he came to me the next day and gave me a piece of paper and it had this poem on it. And he writes every day. He writes something every day, whether it's his blogging on his MySpace or he just writes poetry and, and I read it and I was just like wow it was like it was like the most kind kind of like dark and twisted and also <laughs> you know really like wow like you know dug right into the the, the, the depths of it in a, in a very kind of like wry you know you know wry wit to it and amazing and I was just like wow and so the idea kind of was there but I didn't think he would be interested in doing it and when we got back down to LA and I was talking about the record and um, you know he's, he's very into music obviously he does his corn Cornbugs project with, right. with Buckethead, and he's working with another gentleman. I can't remember the name on a record right now. With, with again, his kind of you know witty titles, witty witty prose, and and and, uh, and 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 poetry kind of put to music. And uh, and uh, so I, I I asked him kind of you know just off the cuff if he wanted to do it, and he heard some of the tracks, and he was like, yeah, you know, count me in. So he came over and literally had four pieces of poetry that he brought with him, and he did them all in sequence. And we actually used it in basically the same sequence he put it out. And you know, once he did Killing Me with Bacon, I was like, I was like, wow, like, you know, we weren't sure how it would weave in, but then it became actually the social commentary that I can't make as a Canadian uh, of America in a lot of ways. If, if, right. if I was to do that poetry for the uh, poem, it would be like, well, fuck you, Canadian, you know, what, what, what the, hell, the hell do you have talking about our country? It was actually somebody who lives in the country who's dealing with a lot of those issues. And so it, it was the perfect commentary that I wanted to make without me having to actually say it, it was brilliant and at that point the album takes this turn and goes in this other place and to this day I listen to it and I'm like it reminds me both of Bill and Toronto and then the fun we had and as well what a, what a great guy he was and he came in and did all those in one take he asked me for direction just on the, the type of voice like what kind of character and uh, <clears throat> he just nailed it all in one take all of them in one take and then we placed them in and we did a bit of um, like in Eye Candy, the, the voices, I wanted to make the voices so they were indis indistinguishable at a certain point. You couldn't tell if it was me or him. And as it leads into Eye Candy, you really hear that kind of transition. And uh, then he became kind of this narration that kind of um, flew over the top of everything and connected a lot of things together. And it really, you know, again, it's like symbiotic or whatever it is. It happened quite you know, a bit of like, you know, mental serendipity or whatever it is. It was just like, um, it worked perfectly with everything. And, uh, and, you know, to this day, I mean, I've always wanted to use something that wasn't, you know, something that you're sampling off of a movie. And again, like you're saying, for me, you know, I was sitting in a movie cinema chair watching Texas Chainsaw 2, 
and, which to me is still one of the best sequels there, there, there probably is as far as uh, as far as you know just going for the just going for, for, for the balls and also having this, oh, this yeah. commentary over top of it that was very again like you know black comedy or dark you know there's a humor to it but mm -hmm. at the same time and Chopped Off especially was the character that just made me made my skin crawl but also made me like fucking laugh out loud it was oh, an amazing yeah character and and so um to have that actually to have him to have a familiar voice but not saying something sampled that people are, are familiar with it created this layer to it that i'm i'm so thankful to him for for doing and uh and on top of that it's just like he was um it's just a great person a great all-around person I'm, I'm happy to have him in my life I mean, we're friends now we've gone hiking and uh, you know we have some plans to, to to do some more stuff i mean he came out and did the spoken word stuff during uh our LA show with his family and uh, so you know it's always uh, a great joy to see him I hope we you know I hope that you know I think it will because we, we have kind of done the hiking thing and we share a lot of similar you know the mindset you know his Hollywood right. mindset isn't a Hollywood mindset and so you know, um, I, again and for me when I first did repo I looked up you know IMDB you know Bill Mosley and I was like didn't know what the fuck to expect <laughs> you know after Right. You know, you know, you see Otis, you see, I mean, the, 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 the places he can go to, oh, the yeah. character, it's just, it's phenomenal. And so it was, again, for me, the whole repo experience was a huge learning experience, working with people like Paul Servino, who's like theatrically trained, or, you know, Anthony Head, who in the same way comes from a theatrical background, but, you know, has movies covered, but the subtleties within these people, and especially like Paul Servino and, and Bill Mosley, because Bill, Bill got along famously with Paul, they, you know, Bill was just cracking jokes to Paul and keeping him kind of like... Within, within, you know, because there was times when um, when Paul was was frustrated with certain things, you mm -hmm. know, as as he he's, he's he has to have things a certain way, and not in a nasty way, but there's just certain things that we were working in a building that was um, basically they were converting over to a studio, either twist, I think it was twisted, was converting it over to a studio, but because we didn't have to worry about sound issues because everything was taped, um, it, we, we nothing was um, sealed. It was, an, it was a building in transition, so it was mm. an old steel building, and there was times we were coming out, you know, spitting up black, basically. You know, so, <laughs> so he had an issue with that and kind of stood up for all of us. But, but you know, Bill would kind of keep things light, and, and you know, he's amazing. With you know, I'm sure you've talked to him. Um, if you haven't talked to him, you'll when, when you do, you'll see what I mean by his rye wood. He's an incredibly you know, sage. At, you know, he's a you know, Yale-educated sage, and he's just uh, amazing. He's an amazing guy. You know, and, and very kind. Very, you know, again, considering oh, yeah. the. I, I met him one time in Baltimore at a con yeah, convention. convention. Yeah. But the you know the reach when you know you go to Otis to to Bill, it's just like like you know there's a natural actor. You know, it's, it's, oh, it's, yeah. it's like natural and innate talent. So for me, I'm a sponge, and, and things like that uh, you know, rub off him. Um, <clears throat> in the future, would you be looking to do anything else? Um, independent or otherwise, you know, horror or yeah, anything. I mean, a anything under makeup, and you know, we're I'm, I'm I'm getting an agent right now and pursuing that. And there's a few things coming up that are, are bigger films that I'm looking at right now. But you know, if, if there's if there's anything that, that you know, I mean, obviously within the realm of you know, not, I'm not really going to do things for spec at this point and stuff like that. I'm more interested in in the. There's not be a lot of money necessarily, but there has to be something that makes it real and right. and it's something that's not going to be you know a waste of time for me necessarily. But it would definitely depend on the project too. If somebody has something that um, you know I'm, I have a discerning eye in the sense of what you know, I've studied horror my whole life uh -huh. and uh, you know I'm one of the bad pack with Forrest Jackerman. I'm, I, I go back that far with you know looking after him and uh, he just passed away on December the fourth. And uh, so that that's one era of my life is the famous Monsters of Filmland era, and then I went through the whole Fangoria era. And you know, for me, the golden age of horror was the early '80s with a lot of the my favorite films are like the Italian horror films. And yeah, it's Suspiria. Yeah. I like I like a lot of Fulci. I like Gates of Hell. I like Fulci's style. However fucked up it is, there's like something that's so fucked up that it works. You know, for me, the weird right. voiceovers, even you know the. Uh, you know the one woman doing you know the boy and the girl voices and you're just like this is so creepy I mean mm -hmm. it works you know and the atmosphere of those films of, of you know you know Mario Bava all that stuff the atmosphere of the Italian films to me that's that's something and you know you know I was a hammer kid too I got scared by all the hammer films as a kid so I've been through I'm a you know I'm a horror I'm a horror junkie although I'm jaded right now because to me there's not a lot of really good good horror and original stuff and Repo you know, whether you love it or hate it you can't deny it, its originality and the fact that for me it was it was something that wasn't co-opted by a major uh, motion picture studio it was supported but it was still the people that actually went out on the street and were doing the project right. 
you know, Terrence Zunich, who plays the Grave Robber, is one of the main writers of the music, along with Darren Smith, who is very much involved with the music and plays the band leader in it. So it has, you know what I mean? It's, it's, um, it, was, it was a great experience. It was, and and, and uh, I think when I, when I talk to the rest of the cast, they say, yeah, I mean, you know, a lot, of, a lot of shoots aren't really like that. There's a lot more ego involved. And no one, everyone kind of put their ego aside to, to like do the film. Everybody took way less money. Obviously, Paul Sorvino did it for next to nothing. And, you know, even Paris was a trooper, you know, coming in. And, uh, and say even coming in and doing everything she did and, and I always kind of when I talked to her I was just saying yeah you should just go for it because you know you should embrace all the things that you think are uncomfortable or like you know your right. face falling off or like being under this horrible makeup and looking you know because that's you should embrace that you know yeah. and, uh, and for me in the same way I was embracing the fact that you know being more of a comedic character which was a gas for me I, mean, I loved it <laughs> I have to say I've decided to stop hating Paris Hilton yeah, I mean, it, that, that, that was the same thing for me. I mean, I, I, I realized that it, it wasn't so much that. I mean, there's, there's, there's aspects to it that I, I don't understand, maybe, but there's, there's certainly, like, you, you realize how, uh, even though you think you're, you're one step outside of what media does to you, it's like what media, unfortunately, does and, and, and everything in, in, you know, this high-level information transfer age is it just kind of truncates all this information down to one one little chunk of something of somebody's yeah. life and, and people's yeah. lives are a lot more complicated oh, yeah. or a lot more um, diverse than that, let me yeah. put it that way. So, you know, I saw Paris in some really cute positions, which I'm not going to, um, not cute and then <laughs> disgusting, but just kind of like, it's kind of like, oh, you know, like, like, you know, that's just Paris being, being a normal person and, and, right. you, and you see that and you can't, you know, you can't, you can't, it, it made me step away from the, the way that I was looking at it, which is more of a generalized kind of, it was a view of more of that, of that style of living more than her personally. And she's caught up in something I know she's going through when I was on the repo set, and I don't think this is giving away too much, but she seemed to be at a point in her life where she was really examining all of that stuff and right. really, really taking a look at it and trying to find meaning for herself. Yeah, the media portrays her really bad. Yeah. I, I try not to buy into much of the media stuff, but... Quite frankly, it's everywhere, you yeah. know. No, it is, and, and, and it's something that sells newspapers and, yeah. and it keeps people looking and it keeps, you know, there's always, you always have to have that that person to be tar and feathered in society that makes you feel yeah. like your life isn't so bad, you know. Ultimately. And until I got to reading about the media stuff, I was just like, oh man, Paris Hilton. Yeah. And then, like, I was reading about the, I'm sorry, <laughs> until I got to reading about the, the repo stuff and, like, interviews and stuff with her, and then I was like, you know what? Maybe she doesn't need to go live on Mars. No, I mean, you know, and I've, I've, I've watched some interviews, and, you know, they, they really hammer her with stuff. You oh, know, yeah. It's just kind of like, come on, you know, like, like fucking get over it, you know. Yeah. I mean, you know, she's, you know, let, let somebody evolve before you, you like, you know, tar and feather them and, oh, and yeah. put them up on this, uh, on this cross that they can't get off of. So, you know, again, it's not my world. I don't understand it. But, you know, uh, you know, I can't knock somebody that can go out and stand in a podium and make $100,000. I mean... I'd do five of those and I'd be the fuck out of here. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like anybody would, you yeah. know, ultimately. Yeah. So. All right, I'll bet I'll not mind you. <laughs> okay. um, you, you're known for being pretty theatrical on stage and now with, you know, acting in repo, it's kind of almost, you know, the perfect thing because um, I watched some old footage of, like, Last Rites in Two Dark Park and it, was, it didn't seem to me like it was so much uh, a concert so much as it was going to see, like, you know, a, a musical, you know, some kind of a horrible, yeah. yeah. It, so now that you've done Repo, and um, do you see yourself ever maybe doing your own film of any kind? Cause well, I mean, I've, I've realized just how difficult film is. Yeah. from doing repo and, 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 and uh, how complicated it is to make I mean you know I make albums for $150,000 by, by committee and that's difficult enough when you're talking about even $8 million and the amount of people that are involved and, and uh, you know when you're talking about something I, I really admire Darren Bowsman for how tough he is and, and how resilient he is and how he fought for this and that's one thing uh, with the backstory that I know of how Lionsgate after Peter Block left uh, brought somebody in who didn't like horror, didn't want horror to be representative of Lionsgate, even though it made Lionsgate. Yeah. Um, they they basically took Midnight Meat Train, put it into dollar cinemas, and one thing, one TV right away. I heard it was on cable right away. 
Really. And then, uh, and the same thing was supposed to happen to Repo, and there been another film under his under his shepherd was a, a Western horror called The Burrowers, which is gone basically. And then the guy basically, it's it's more about somebody who comes in and goes, "This is going direct to video," because I don't want anything to do with this, like pissing on the corpse of your predecessor. And all. Right. And uh, and then the movie, you know, Darren pushed and pushed and pushed, and the movie got tested again with. With with the, with the proper um, processing on the print and with the effects all in, and it tested really well. And then Reap, and then Lionsgate starts sending out to certain reviewers, hand picked, I think, bad copies on DVD mm. of, of of the disc, to where like you know you, you have people in the village voice saying it looks like it was shot on a cell phone, and it doesn't look that way. You know, it's because of the print they got was like that. So there's a real underhanded um, because Darren fought for it with this guy. They fought back and said basically, you know, I've heard stories of executives at a dinner um, basically uh, you know cheering toasting to the uh, to the downfall of repo and to mm. the death of Darren Bousman's career which is uh, you know it's, it's almost it's like a Roman Senate conspiracy in a lot of ways yeah. but again it's because you, you really can't tell somebody that, that they're wrong it's, it's the idea of like within the government you have different levels of clearance of uh, and the way that they keep secrets within that this is a bit off topic, but the way they keep secrets is, is if you're a general and you're above me and I'm a, I'm a radar reader, but we have the same clearance, but I have more access within that because I have a need to know access that you don't. Because you're a general and you have an ego, and I come up and tell you, look, at I had to go and wash off, you know, I had to go and Photoshop out four discs that were seen on the moon and the shadows and everything. And you'll be like, well, I didn't hear about that, so it doesn't exist. And that's, that's kind of within the idea of, of the, of, of, from what I understand now about the movie business, if, if, if somebody says at that level, says, no, this is going direct to video, this is shit, then it goes back, even if it tests well, it's still shit, and it's going to go direct to video, and no matter what, you know what I mean? It's that yeah. kind of thing. And so that's what, that's the struggle of Repo's happening, because ultimately it has an audience, mm -hmm. um, it's finding its audience, and Darren, again, getting back to Darren, which is something that I don't think I'd have, I'd have the muster to do, maybe, maybe I would, but he, he's fought tooth and nail and put his own money into these road tours. He's going out and doing it and creating something. And, and I have the deepest respect for, for that. Because he's out there putting his own money behind his film where, uh, you know, Lionsgate has put out nine theaters with no advertising, nothing, you know. And still kids are coming out and like, you know, they're dressing up with the characters, they're singing the songs. It's they're like having a, they're, they're, they're having a good really time, is. you know. I, I think it was bad to compare it to that though. I think it should have, you know, when it first tested, they, could, they, they called it, uh, uh, a, a horror, a horror musical in the vein of Saw, which it isn't. It's not. You know, it's just done by the producers. It's, it's produced by, but it's, it's not that type of film at all. So it's just like, you know, bad marketing. They didn't know. Again, it's like it's like the idea of like you give somebody a piece of gold and they then they treat it like shit. You know, right. and it's like it's like they could have marketed that in so many ways, but they don't know how to really because they're so used to doing this normal song and dance. You know, which is just, yeah. it's a program song and dance within the film industry and. Ultimately, I can take that back to the idea of like, well, film is truly America's, is the West propaganda in a lot of ways. So, yeah. you know, those things that step outside of that a little bit, maybe, you know, you look at Brazil, you look at Terry Gilliam's career, you know, and then you look at what happened to him after he, re he released Brazil and he was banned here and uh, he fought for the director's cut. And you see things, you just wonder sometimes, you know, what, what else is involved, especially right. when you look at how, how powerful the medium of film is. That's getting a bit esoteric. I'm not really on track with this. This is a cult <laughs> film. This is a cult film that's a lot of fun that a, a lot of people didn't understand, and, and I think now Darren's proving them wrong. Yeah, and that's good to see because it, it looks so different and new and, and, and fresh, and not you know j just the same old you know sequel, sequel, remake, 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 sequel, or or movies that have almost the exact same plot line as thousands of other films that I've seen. Like right. I'm tired of hearing about, oh, this great new film, it's a couple of people get lost somewhere and some horrible hillbillies attack them and eat them. Overcome, you know, overcome. Now, this is different in the sense that, you know, it's a, it's a very interesting ensemble cast, um, you know, and, and I was lucky to be a part of it, again, you know, I was, I was the last one to be signed on, basically, but having, you know, Sarah Brightman in the same film as Anthony Head, as Lexa Vega, as, like, Paul Sorvino, I mean, it's a very unique kind of cast, I think, for that type of a film, and, uh, and again, it's, it, it, is, it is something that kind of steps off the, uh, the boundaries. It's sung, which is, makes it difficult for some people. The entire thing is sung, so you actually have to listen 
but uh, I, I've seen it three times now, and, and uh, you know, every every time I see it, I, I enjoy it more and from, from 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 getting farther away from making it, you know. And of course, you know, I see all the things, you know, I see the fact that it was a very um, adventurous project, and it was a lot to take on for the shooting schedule. They had, I think, they had a twenty-eight day shooting schedule to do all of, you know, all the songs, all the setups. You know, it was incredible, and and so they had to make some concessions along the way. From what they originally just because of budgetary and, and time and time restraints, you know. But the way it was put together, and you know, seeing the you know all of the set um, plans and the blueprints and how they those sets were switched around is just amazing. You know, it's an incredible process. So getting back to your question about making films, I would love to, but it, I think it's, it's a very intense process. And and, and for me, and you know, I told Darren this. I said, you know, with, with every film that you do, it's it's almost like me starting a new band. You have to kind of start with you know you have to create a fan base. You have to you know it's a it's incredibly, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's a tough sell, especially for a film like that, which is really kind of, you know, it, it's its own thing. It's not something you can compare to something else to, right. to where you have a built-in market for in a way. You know, this will appeal to so-and-so. You can go Rocky Horror, but then you got to be careful with that because everybody's so sacred about Rocky Horror, you right. know, and, you know, so, but, but he's, he's, he's doing a really good job. Yeah, I heard he even um, spent his own money to make a 10-minute trailer yes. for it to get them to even agree to make yeah. it. Well, they weren't going to do it. I mean, yeah. he, he, like, approached them with the idea, I think, in Saw, after he did the Saw 2, Saw 3, and then finally, you know, did, did that on his own money, showed them, and they were like, okay, you know, you can do it. You know, but it was a lot of, you know, pulling and pushing, and, you know, tough, tough, tough guy. I mean, he, he like, he, um, I'm sure, aged a lot on this film, you know, no, no doubt. He went through a lot of stuff. And the letters that I saw of just, you know, how much he, he was just, you know, continually supporting it, even in, in the face of, of the abyss, you know. Yeah. And, he, and he made something happen, you know, and that, that's, that's amazing, you know. Yeah, I was really excited to see that it was hitting other cities yeah. other than the, the initial tour. And yeah. And it's picking up theaters beyond his road tour, too. It's, mm -hmm. it's theaters are starting to pick it up because they're seeing, they're seeing, like, you know, there's some theaters. There's one, one, one theater owner who's telling me that is he calling me? He goes, you know, I'm really pissed off at you because for the last month, all I've had are calls about repo. And it was <laughs> night. It was it was it was tongue in cheek. He was just saying, yeah. you know, I've never been more busy in my life having to answer calls and turn people away from seeing the seeing the movie. Uh, so. Great. Um, I guess that's awesome. Really it? Yeah. Wait, I have a question. Go see repo. Be sure to check out Ogre's new release, Devils in My Details, and information about the tour by visiting ogre.org. And also check out information on where you can see Repo the Genetic Opera by visiting repo-opera.com. Thanks for watching.